we're back looking at Team Ninja's latest game. And this time they're taking on an open world setup. It's a different approach compared to their tried and true level based mission structure. So to see them tackle this is very interesting. On one side it can be very stagnant with how they offer its content, but on the other hand, what if they pull through making this fun and enjoyable? So let's just see how well they did. This is Combat Overview. Here we go over the general controls, the main mechanics, who or what we use them on, and then seeing how it all comes together. Have your standard basic combo. Holding forward as you attack will do an advancing attack. Great to build off that base combo, space enemies out, or use as a quick burst option. It reminded me a bit of Onimusha, honestly. While we don't have back attacks, but we do have charged ones. So by holding square, you'll do this unique attack depending on your weapon and its stats. These can be comboed into as well, either to crowd control, retreat, toss a little combo of its own, break key, and so much more. We also get this grappling hook, used for traversal of course, but combat too. Can throw nearby objects like swords or explosive barrels to crowd control, even works on panicked enemies to fling them at each other. Can steal items like heals or, or weapon buffs if you're quick enough. If you use the hook after a jump, you'll zoom towards them with an attack. It's basically a flying swallow. Can even use it to avoid certain attacks. Oh, and if they're above you, you can yank them down, which opens them up for a critical strike. There's actually quite a bit to it. Onto defense, got ourselves a dash step with a single press and double tap for a roll. They both have iframes, so just a solid way to reposition. Now guarding. You can walk around a bit, it'll snap towards attacks, and there's no chip damage to your health either. You can even dash step instantly as soon as an enemy hits your block just like a ninja guided so yeah it's an extremely solid guard we'll go into why you can't hold it forever but for now don't underestimate how useful it is early on it's actually a good idea to just watch the patterns and learn timings as you block because once you start to get a feel for things you'll be ready to deflect or counter spark as it's called here solid reactionary option because it cancels attacks mid animation and with each attack you deflect it'll help chip at their max key bit by bit Sometimes you'll toss out an entire combo that won't be stopped by a single counter spark, but you can chain deflects back to back which does massive key damage and will leave them exposed. When this happens they'll go into this panic state, shown by the red surrounding their health and key. This means they're vulnerable for a brief moment to land even more hits. Nice thing is, nearby enemies will back off too, so don't worry, you'll be able to follow up. Now the more efficient you are flowing between stances and weapons really making the most of these moments, lowering their max key even lower, it all goes towards breaking them, leaving them exposed for a critical attack, similar to Neo. Yep, you get iframes on it, and just like Ninja Gaiden, these are pretty brutal and gory. Not only that, but you can counter spark Gunge which gives you a buff, and reflex that bullet, stunning them for a bit which lets you follow up with the Flying Swallow. Or CS arrows or bombs or torches too. So yeah, Counter Spark is a very powerful tool that can turn the tides of a battle, but don't be so Counter Spark happy because mashing these with no thought will get you messed up fast since there's quite a bit of end lag if mistimed, you lose key, and you'll most likely get hit, losing a chunk of your health. So I really don't recommend tossing these out all over the place. Once you're experienced and know the patterns, then deflex are worth it. Until then, guarding is extremely useful because honestly, enemies and bosses will fight back. They're not helpless punching bags letting you spam attacks for free, they'll answer back with hyper armor attacks. I wouldn't say there's some Kingdom Hearts 2 revenge value stuff going on, but I approach every enemy with that similar mindset, that if I mash, I'll get punished. So there's give and take where you need to push your advantage when you get the opening, but you still need to respect their options. One of the main ones being red unblockable attacks. You can counter spark these dealing massive key damage or play a smart by dodging out of the way. Again, counter spark isn't this be all and all strat, the game even tells you it's okay not to deflect everything. You can if you master that boss or enemy type, you'll be heavily rewarded for it, but there's definitely moments when it's best to just hold your ground guarding or roll away to reposition. It's definitely not an over centralizing mechanic. Like I mentioned earlier with the attack options, Onimusha Warlords is the best comparison here. These sends are extremely strong and reward enemy knowledge, but that's not your sole defensive option. Using your guard and footwork are amazing to use too. You got a pretty solid set of tools here, so try them all out. Looking at the HUD, the white meter is health, and the blue meter on top is our key. Every attack, counter spark, dodge roll, and skill uses key. 
And to circle back a bit, guarding attacks will chip away at your key and holding it will slow down its regen by a noticeable amount. So you can't be overly passive because they'll open you up eventually, either by breaking your guard or with an unblockable attack. To refill that key, just drop your guard and it'll refill on its own. Or you can do the more interesting option, successful counter sparks. Yeah, these refill key. Now this opens up some risk reward between our key and counter sparking. Like I said, you can play it safe letting your key take the damage, which means you have less key to work with to attack afterwards, right? Or you can risk it with counter sparks to lower their key while refilling yours to really make an impact once they're vulnerable. But still, you gotta consider if you really wanna risk your key because if you miss, be ready to take that damage or even overexhaust, leaving yourself wide open for an even harsher punishment. There's some give and take there. So if you're low on key, do you wanna get card broken? Do you want to use your last sliver of key to roll away or risk it all and rely on your enemy knowledge and timing to CS their combo? And when you have low health on top of that too, it'll really make you question your deflex skills. So it's something to keep in mind. Okay, with all that key of ours, we can use some martial skills. Hold R1 to open up this menu and we have these skills tied to each face button. So you're not invulnerable when they're used, but you do get hyper armor, so you won't be interrupted. But yeah, there's some to crowd control, destroy key, to move in or move out. Adachi has its overhead one to get past defenses, even has its own counter and even a command grab when you break their key. Katana has its evasive sidestep and so, so much more. These martial skills have real use depending on the situation or just some fun ones to toss out because they're hype. There might be something here we're all fans of. Also, there's some very helpful videos and descriptions to let you know how each skill works. And with how many options we have, yeah, you're going to need this. Now, I keep mentioning stances. What are those, right? So these are equipable play styles. Hold R1 and with the right thumbstick, you can pick one of three stances. One of my favorites being the pretty obvious one, the Ninja Gaiden callback. It does the same pose and everything. It even has some familiar base attacks. The skills are basically UTs. You can even charge it up for a powerful version. And yeah, we get the Azuna drop. Now a nice detail I liked a lot is how holding triangle won't send you up. There's actually two versions depending if you tap or held the input. It worked exactly like this back in Ninja Gaiden so it's very cool how much they paid attention. Kind of reminded me how Kingdom Hearts 2 paid attention when bringing over Kingdom Hearts 1 moveset. Now that's not the only callback because we also get a Neo inspired stance. You want to know what's wild about it? It actually has low, mid, and high attacks. And they all have their own advancing, held, and basic combo too even their own skill to use for each variation. So this one stance has stances in it. These two alone give the combat a lot of options for any situation. But there's also this evasive shinobi stance where you hold the katana backwards, or this EI stance dishing out blade beams. These are pretty different from one another to say the least and this is just for the one weapon. And each of these have their own combo, board and held attack. They all have three skills. Yeah, you get movesets on movesets. And that's just for one weapon. There's a whole second weapon on you that also has three unique stances with all their own differences that make real impact in combat. You can use katana, of course, adachi, dual blade, spears, pull arms, sabers, great swords, and even a bayonet. We've seen these weapons for a while, but we've given them a whole new way to interact with them with these stances. And the bayonet, man, it's so damn cool. You know how I am with katanas, but this bayonet was just so fun to use. It's actually kind of wild how much Team Ninja went above and beyond with this, honestly. Just a solid amount of customization over your own playstyle. You can stick to your blades, you can go guns blazing with rifles and revolvers, or do a mix of the two, right? Really cool stuff. And oh yeah, you can swap weapons and styles on the fly mid-combo doing this sweep attack. Not only is it great to crowd control a bit, but it also lets you go right into another combo with little downtime. So with these stances and the second weapon, the combat comes down to standard combo into forward attack, or combo to held attack, or you can combo all three together. There's fun to be had mixing, charge, and advancing attacks. There's switching on the fly to continue your combo even further, all while you're on the lookout for your enemy's combo so you can react in time to keep your turn going. It actually has a nice back and forth to it. And of course, just like Neo, you can manually seize your weapon. And if you hold R3 instead of the single press, it actually does a unique blade wipe animation. It's gonna be pretty fun seeing all those little variations. Speaking of which, there's actually a blood buildup and wipe mechanic called Blade Flash. So with each attack you land, this little bar beneath your main weapon fills up. 
doing the switching weapons and stance attacks and those glory kills fill this gauge the most. Keep that in mind. But yeah, it doesn't gradually empty over time if unused. It'll stay there and it's all up to you when you want to cash out. So to use it, press R1 after an attack to convert that meter into key. The amount it refills is based on how much is stocked up, which means it doesn't have to be full to use. But yeah, the more the better so we can shorten downtime as much as possible. It actually reminded me of Oni Chambada, how you can clean your blade to stay in the action. But something I, I wish Rise of the Ronin took from those games is how they let you reposition with sidesteps as I did this. Instead, you hunker down in place with each flash. So it does feel a bit limited, but rarely if ever did I get hit because of it. Which is good, but there's some room for fine tuning, that's for sure. Okay, this might get messy, so bear with me. When locked on, you'll notice these colored icons. These change depending on the stance type you're currently using. Now wait, it's not what you think. From when I tested, there's no damage difference to key or the house. So it won't be a color-coded enemy situation where it limits which styles you can use. No, none of that is here. I would purposely use red icons and all my attacks, skills, and so on to work as intended. So, hopefully that's cleared up. But it does determine how long enemies are stunned after a counter spark. If you have the most effective stance, they'll completely turn around giving yourself the largest opening to land an extra guaranteed hit or two. But if red, they'll recover pretty much instantly. Thing is though, they'll most likely attack soon after. So you can use that against them to destroy their key this way since it's like a bait. Again, there doesn't seem to be difference in damage to either key or health. I see as the same command grab once with red and once with blue. The only difference is their stagger time. That's all. So I wouldn't say a stance is a must pick when fighting. It's all up to you. you can use stances based on their different attacks, range, speed, functions, and so on. The arrows are only there for stagger after counter spark. This won't pigeonhole you at all. The game itself actually tells you that a counter spark will always be good no matter which weapon type or style you use. Okay, hopefully that eased some worries because I was there too when I saw this, but hopefully we're good. Okay, we're not done yet. Who would have thought, right? A Team Ninja game with a lot of interlocking mechanics. <sighs> I'm starting to think this is a Kingdom Hearts game, but yeah. This orange meter is Keyblaze. It fills up by landing attacks and counter sparks. Once activated, it'll interrupt whatever nearby enemies are doing. So it's a solid reversal comeback mechanic. It'll buff you and your allies' weapons. You'll get unlimited key, but it's replaced with this timer instead, as it gradually empties. No hyper armor, so you have to respect enemies still. But counter sparks are made easier while in this powered up state, which is nice. And if you do decide to blade flash, it'll do this crowd control burst around you. Okay, <laughs> lastly, our sub weapons. I'll start with the revolver. If you want more rising Xan, well, here you go. They got this six shooter to sneak in some extra damage. There's even upgrades to get a unique follow up attack out of a dodge, which is pretty hype. And one of the best reasons to have the revolver equipped is getting this alternate glory kill. Now, the trade off is that you won't get any blood buildup but it does way more damage than the regular critical attack. So it's up to you how you want to resource manage with these, which is pretty cool. There's also rifles and bows. These are great when you're undetected to get a stealth kill, but you do not want to use these in middle of fight because these enemies can move, ducking and sliding and do whatever they got to do to get it on you. And my favorite one, the shuriken. These are pretty fun, and that's because we can do shuriken cancels. The ninja guided influences are still here. But yeah, it works on basic advancing and held attacks to close a gap, keep an enemy in check, or reposition. Found it pretty useful after critical attacks to create space, and after blade wipes to sort of mimic Onichambada sidesteps. All around, it's pretty useful to avoid attacks and keep on the move. I need to make this upgrade part quick because I have a feeling this is going to be a long video, as it is, so... Okay, be sure to check your items because there's going to be a lot of stat boost in there. You get them from basically doing anything in this game, so keep an eye on those. But those skill points, you can buy skills, obviously. I'm going to tell you right now, the RPG stuff here is basically non-existent compared to Neo. No overtuned builds stuff going on. This game is straying away from Neo RPG elements and gets closer to Ninja Gaiden. Just get skills, your favorite weapons, and the stances you like, and you're set to go. There's one kind of stat thing, so after unlocking one or two skills in a certain tree, it raises these stats in the corner a bit. That's it, very simple. And honestly, I never noticed it was there until after I beat the game, so yeah. Character customization, oh man, it's insane. 
This has the most amount of options I've ever seen from them. Different hats, helmets, headbands, masks, chain shirt, undershirt, jacket, pants, from elite soldiers to student kimonos. Belts have enormous options from wraps, ropes, and not even mentioned gloves, gauntlets, sandals, boots, shoes, scarves, ties, eye patches. So many options. <laughs> from traditional Japanese attire to all the new options from the Western world. And with all the clothes, weapons, and styles, you can play as a ninja, a ronin, a general, or a mix of everything like our guy, Rising Zan. Not only can you freely customize yourself from head to toe at your house, you can hang out with your companions, can talk to them, give them gifts like it's on Musha too. Doing this or visiting where they are will lead into bond missions where you'll build favor with them, which goes to getting new stances or leveling them up. So it's worth doing these. And if you really like someone, you can even romance them. How sweet. But uh, be warned because there's a lot of cuties in this game, so it's going to be a tough choice. Trust me. You did splendidly. I have a feeling that this is the start of a beautiful relationship. We'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Till next time. When it comes to enemies, they're a lot more grounded in reality. So no yokai or any mystical type of enemies. You're going to be up against humans and animals like wolves and boars. Yeah, way more down to earth. But what helps give them variety are the stances. Because it's not just you who has a variety of styles and weapons, so do the enemies. And with what, over 40 stances in the game? It's going to be fun to fight them all since you're taking down enemies that use similar options as you. It actually feels like I'm playing a PvP game sometimes. So am I assigned stripped back or simplified compared to other games at first? But no, you go up against a solid set of enemies that only get more and more complex. Fighting some guy who uses a katana will be very different the more you get into the game. And the fact we have this much variations in, in combos and timings, don't feel bad if it takes a bit to pick up on the patterns. Just give it time, give it time. For bosses, it's similar to what we just saw with regular enemies. They use the same weapons you have and they will use some sort of specialized version of those stances though, or use weapons we don't have access to. So they do bring their own spin to things and feel more advanced than the rest. Like this guy who dual wields a shield and bayonet, this girl who uses a whip, and there may or may not be a guy who uses jet boots. Who knows? Speaking about those bosses, there's different dojos you can visit that let you practice against everyone you met so far pretty much. You could take them on one on one to get some rewards depending on how well you did. Based on how quick you take them down, how much damage did you take, and how many counter sparks slash crit attacks did you land. It's basically Cuphead's rating system. Doing these even raises their bond with them and levels up their styles too. But yeah with all these different masters it's basically a boss rush. Quite a long one too. And yeah, I'm not going to go over every single boss or most of them since there's just so many of them. It'll be a fool's errand. But I will mention this. In the open world, there's hidden bosses tucked away for you to find. Or to just look up on YouTube where to find them like I did. One of them is our favorite ninja. It's basically a tradition now to have a real boss fight of some kind. He'll do flying swallows, on landing cancels, and even try to pull off a few tees. And oh yeah, be careful about that Izuna drop. And we've come full circle with these cameo super bosses because William from Neo is here as a hidden boss too. And you already know, we have our rival. You'll fight your blade twin a few times throughout the story. She'll use different weapons, stances, her prosthetic arm, and will even counter spark you too. And each time you clash swords, so use different tactics so you get to feel that growth over time. But for that final battle, she'll constantly switch weapons and stances to keep you on your toes. Apply elemental buff or will even try to heal, but you can yank that away if you're fast enough. She even try to use her own key blades the same as you can for that last ditch effort. I really like how you have to defeat your rival in a true 1v1. You can't summon or have companions here, which is pretty great. They did this in Neo 1, but not in 2 sadly. So it's awesome they actually make you earn it here. And that's Rise of the Ronin. I was skeptical going into it, but it didn't take long before I saw all the great aspects of a Team Ninja title. Bidou Ninja Gaiden, Neo, Stranger of Paradise, Wolong, and so on. It's this all-in-one package to give people a taste of everything they have to offer. Now even though they went with the open world setting, I think it was handled pretty well. The structure is very formulaic and we know what to expect here, but I do understand it has a very large, casual appeal. It's very inviting, right? So to me, I see this one as a kind of 
a gateway game. My hopes will get more people into the door to appreciate Team Ninja's catalog with this one. It actually feels on par with Neo on how much is jam packed here. Great combat, nice art style, pretty solid set of characters, tons of replayability, and just a lot of worthwhile content. I never got the impression they had to sacrifice certain aspects to make this open world work. To me, it delivers on all fronts, giving me a new experience while delivering on all their favorite bits I like about their past games. Because after you beat the game, you get a whole new skill tree to unlock your Blade Twins playstyle and a bunch of general stat boosts to dump into for late game leveling. There's also Midnight Mode. It's New Game Plus that ups the challenge a good bit. More enemy camps are added. Enemies get quite a bit more advanced because they'll switch weapons and stances now. Even major bosses will show up in these camps to make it that much more interesting. You can also replay past main and side missions to choose other options to see different routes. They all lead to the same outcome, but you do fight different bosses. Not only that, but doing these will open up unique bond mission quest lines for members in that faction. So it's still worth trying out because it leads to more content. Or you can just stay in the base game to clean up unfinished quests and side activities. The great thing is you can freely jump back and forth between New Game Plus, base game, and all three maps whenever you want. You're not locked out of anything. You can just go at your own pace. Games give you a lot of freedom, just like Neo did. Speaking of which, the amount of content here is what you would expect from Neo. There's quite a lot here. It took me around 25 hours to beat the game, and right now I'm on my way to 50, and I still have more to go. And I haven't even begun doing the little collectible stuff. I'm gonna do all that way later, the same way I did with the Kadamas and Hot Springs. I've just been doing the side quests, bond missions, branching options, enemy cams, using new weapons, stances, taking on masters, and so on. Everything just circles back to combat, which is why I like their open world approach. I never spent time running around aimlessly wasting time. That's all thanks to the horses. They're super quick and will instantly teleport to you whenever you call them, which is a nice touch. And the more you explore, the more fast travel points you create, which lowers the downtime even further. There's literally no reason for you to be running on foot. This isn't Dragon's Dogma. But if you do for whatever reason, at least heat isn't used up so you can sprint infinitely. And the glider is fun to use too. So there's a lot of nice quality of life stuff to make exploration very immediate. And if you're like me and just want to get to the action as quick as possible, you can even skip cutscenes and dialogue as well. It's not like other games where they force you to watch 20 plus hours of footage. So despite the open world setup, Ronin is still all about go go go, prioritizing combat. All the activities in the game have you visit new locations, which leads to higher target fugitives, enemy camps, dojo masters, main and side quests to take on new enemies and bosses, they really made sure combat was key to the overall experience and really paid attention to the small things, giving the game some personality to it where they can. All the new gestures that were never there in past games, how well they replicated their other games playstyles with the stances, and how the main menu would change as you go through the story. And even though there's less otherworldly aspects, they play off those expectations with some side quests. Stuff like that is pretty neat to see. It still bumps me out, it wasn't stage based. But there was a mission where we visit this cave. Basically a dungeon. Having these multi-tiered areas with winding hallways, secret spots, keys, shortcuts, glowing pickups to catch your eye so you can figure out how to get to those. And along the way there's wire traps, falling logs, and threatening enemies all jam-packed in this nice compact area. This was definitely the highlight for me. So it's good to know they still got it. But if you're still unsure then you can wait a year because they're always on top of their A-game adding more expansions. Going off to past games since Neo 1 back in 2017, they have a pretty solid track record of supporting their games after launch. I can see them expanding the story, adding more areas, new armor, new weapon types, new enemies and bosses to take on, more difficulty modes to remix encounters even further, more end game content and overall gameplay tune-ups. Maybe more stances too, right? Hopefully they add that drunken style because I've never seen that done before. But yeah, just all around improvements to a game that's already full of stuff to dig into. So if you want to hold off till then, that's good too. But what's here currently is pretty damn fun and filled to the brim with worthwhile stuff to do. What other game goes from Azuna dropping dudes one second to petting good puppers the next? Go ahead. I'll wait. Hmm. 